Hello, and thank you for joining us for this world-class expertise webinar. Today we'll be talking about um, dry and low moisture environment cleaning and sanitation, no rinse required. Amy Lieski um, will be on the line to talk about um, the basics of cleaning and sanitation um, in dry and low moisture environments. And Rick will um, cover how that is important, um, how that impacts your allergen management in your plant. As stated before, you are muted, um, but please submit any questions via the Q&A um, box on the bottom right, and we'll address as many as we can uh, at the end of the webinar. Um, thank you again for joining, and with that, I will pass it to Amy um, to kick off the webinar. Thank you, Megan, and welcome to all joining today. To lay out the structure of today's talk, we will first outline how dry cleaning and sanitizing procedures fit into a comprehensive sanitation program, followed by a discussion on common dry cleaning challenges and water management techniques. Then we'll delve into tools and best practices for cleaning and sanitizing in dry environments, spending a bit of time to really focus in on allergen management CNS tactics. And finally, we'll wrap up with in-market solutions for dry or low moisture environment sanitation. So when we consider why facilities dry clean, it's most often tied directly to the need to reduce water. And water reduction is prioritized for a variety of reasons, including protecting food safety, maintaining or improving product quality, and or reaching sustainability goals. So Ecolab has created solutions that center around reduction and total elimination of water in facilities to meet those goals. And while many plants focus on reducing water usage for those sustainability goals, most facilities usually already consume a lot of water, and those sustainability goals are usually related to cost efficiency. So today, however, we're going to focus on the reduction or elimination of water to protect your product or your process or worker safety. Water supports microbiological growth, can interfere with sensitive electrical equipment, under certain settings, or can create hazardous conditions for employees. So if water is removed from the equation, we greatly increase our chances of success in eliminating those hazards. So let's start off with some basic definitions. A dry process environment is anywhere where no or low moisture is needed in cleaning and sanitizing solutions to protect either your equipment, your process, your product quality, or worker safety. Dry cleaning really does have the same goals as wet cleaning. We want to make sure that we're focusing on food safety and product quality. Um, there's just a little bit different tools and different timelines when we dry clean, which we will go over in today's webinar. So we've heard from industry that there are six key challenges to creating and maintaining a dry environment. First, it's really hard to keep a dry area completely dry. And keeping an environment dry does not mean not cleaning it. The facilities still need to clean and sanitize. It just means that you have to reduce or eliminate the use of water in, in your cleaning practices. And that's a lot easier said than done because another challenge when reducing water is maintaining cleaning effectiveness of traditionally wet cleaning solutions. Any dry cleaning intervention should be equally effective as a wet cleaning procedure. Safety is another really big hurdle to dry process cleaning. Oftentimes, dry cleaning correlates to an increase in manual labor. Pressure hoses or foam units can't be relied on to do the cleaning anymore. Rather, employees are kind of the traditional workhorse of dry cleaning. This means that personnel need to get closer to equipment, closer to the cleaning tool, and closer to the cleaning chemistry. So the entire environment and intervention needs to be safe for human contact. Because a lot of manual labor is involved, productivity is oftentimes called out as being a challenge as well. However, when done correctly, dry cleaning time should equal the time it takes to wet clean, and in some instances, should even take less time than wet cleaning. And then the last two challenges that are really prevalent in dry cleaning processes are fitting those sanitation controls into a comprehensive program 
and making them easy to understand and easy to use. And dry processes you implement should really fit with the rest of your cleaning procedures in the plant. That's what we mean by that comprehensive program. You don't want to introduce a new expensive cleaning tool just to clean one piece of equipment or one part of your plant. You want to make sure that it can help to clean the plant from end to end. And really any cleaning solution should ultimately be made easy to use uh, to reduce training limitations and to improve productivity. So we need to consider dry processing as that holistic program or that comprehensive program instead of a simple one-off solution in a plant. So all of these features around this circle are really needed to maintain a truly dry processing environment. First, at the top of the circle here, we want to understand when is it appropriate to use dry cleaning versus wet cleaning. Ask yourself when trying to determine if an area should be dry cleaned. Ask yourself these questions. Look for red flag. Is that piece of equipment adjacent to a wet clean piece of equipment? Maybe there's a drain under that piece of equipment that you really want to dry clean. Do people oftentimes run past those wet tools? Uh, you really, before introducing new procedures for dry cleaning, you want to make sure that you can control the moisture in surrounding environments. And those questions usually segue into water management techniques. So, Continuing around this, this piece of the pie here, focus on, on how water can be controlled in your environment. If there's parts of your processes that use water or need to be wet cleaned, where does that water go? And how are barriers maintained to make sure it doesn't interact with dry processing or dry cleaning tactics? CNS is obviously going to be a large part uh, of what we talk about today um, and trying to develop and maintain procedures for proper cleaning and sanitizing. Hygiene, uh, you want to make sure that personnel um, are maintaining great hygiene and housekeeping tactics. Pest elimination is, is a huge one in dry processing environments. A lot of the food produced in dry processes are very attractive to rodents, so pest elimination is, is also a piece of our puzzle. Plant traffic and zoning, this definitely relates to cross-contamination discussions, especially if there are wet and dry areas of your plant, which is most common. Training is going to be another big piece. We want to make sure that we explain to employees why we're introducing these dry processes and procedures. Otherwise, they could deviate if they don't know why they're doing what they're doing and why water in some areas are more detrimental than others. And then obviously anything that we implement, we need to do validation and verification on. So how are we going to measure our clean? What's our standard of clean and how do we achieve that? And then ongoing verification. What methods are we going to use, whether it's swabbing, visual, ATP, any other um, sort of verification that we're going to be using. So effective dry cleaning is challenging due to some variables such as soil type, restrictions on water use, equipment design, or extended intervals between cleaning. So we're going to go around the site here and just touch on those challenges um, and specifically why they're, you know, introduced in dry processing. Soil, there's a lot of different soils when you're working in a dry food or dry processing environment. We've got fats, sugars, starches, proteins. Oftentimes they can be loose and dusty, or they can be baked on or fried on the surface. Um, so we need to figure out ways to dry clean all sorts of different soils. Cross-contamination, as I mentioned, is going to be a big part if you have a facility that is wet cleaned and dry cleaned in some areas. So you want to make sure that you're implementing barriers between those areas and making your dry environment as dry as it can be. And that includes altering process or facility design to make sure that those areas are separated, and then also intensive personnel training to make sure they know what areas are dry and what areas can be wet. Equipment design is going to be another big part of knowing when to dry clean. Oftentimes, equipment is, is very difficult to clean, a lot of OEMs make the equipment to work how it's supposed to work and maybe not clean how it's supposed to be clean. So we want to make sure that any intervention we implement is going to clean the entire piece of equipment, whether it's 
small nooks and crannies, we need to make sure that we're getting in there. And then any cleaning chemistry that we put into our plan needs to be compatible with that equipment. So we need to consider what it's made out of and is our cleaning chemistry going to be compatible with that. And then also extended time between cleans are very prevalent in dry environments. Uh, dry soils definitely don't get as gummy or caked on as, as wet soils usually do, so we don't need to clean them as often we find. So maybe you just do incremental housekeeping every, at the end of every production and then have a deep clean maybe once a week or maybe once a month if you can go that long um, without a deep clean. But that means that we need to be doing things in between those deep cleans. We need to reduce the soil accumulation on surfaces and make sure that we have housekeeping tactics to keep that soil level down. So moving into water management, like I said, dry environments are rarely completely dry. So we want to look at how do we manage the water that's coming into our plant. And it's number one and number two here. It's prevention and control. First, if we can at all do this, prevent moisture from being introduced into a dry area. That means that you can keep a, an environment as dry as possible if you prevent moisture from coming in. But that's, again, easier said than done. So if we have water coming in, let's have procedures already developed to control that moisture. Let's know how to clean that up how to get that out of there if it does come in. And we really want to think from a bacteria's perspective. What's the bacterial risk of water coming into an environment? Water sources can come from a variety of places, uh, ingredients, milk, water, anything that is, is liquid or has moisture activity um, coming into the food product itself. Production water is going to be a common one. You can have residual pooling from equipment, or if you have cold areas of a plant, um, there's going to be some condensation. Um, think about humidity, uh, depending on where you are, where uh, your plant is located. It could be very hot and humid. If you think about Florida in the summer, the walls tend to be sweating sometimes. It's so hot and humid down there. So you can think of that as another source of moisture or water vapor condensing on hot pipes that's going to be another source of moisture and, and going to have to be contained in a dry environment and then all obviously we've got environmental concerns uh, you know plants are always getting older they're never getting newer uh, so any types of leaks in equipment and the facility itself uh, really need to be contained um, and 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 looked at ahead of time before they cause a problem. So we need to have knowledge that having a water in an area is detrimental and how do we fix that. So a dry environment itself is not really conducive to standard cleaning and sanitizing methods. Ecolab standard four by four method of pre-rinsing, washing, rinsing, and then sanitizing would introduce a lot of water itself. Uh, which is harmful to a dry environment in terms of food safety and product quality. And consumers' tastes have also started changing. They've necessitated the increase of flavors and seasoning, which translates to a lot of changeovers. Um, so changeovers in process also, you know, ha make us need to dry clean more often because we need efficient, quick cleaning and sanitizing procedures in the middle of production. So how do these needs for dry cleaning translate into a four factors of our wash cycle, into a time, mechanical action, chemistry, temperature? Well, in a traditional wet cleaning process, we usually use high temperatures, pretty concentrated chemistry, takes a bit of time with all of those rinsing, pre-rinsing and rinsing steps, um, and pretty low mechanical action on workers' parts, right? We can just use hoses or foam units to do the mechanical action for us. But when we look at dry cleaning, those factors change in how we're going to be doing our work. So temperature and chemistry are reduced greatly um, because employees are coming in contact with these solutions more. So we can't use 140-degree water. 
We have to use probably a room temperature solution. Chemistry usually has to be more on the neutral side, safer to, to use and maybe less PPE requirements. Uh, mechanical action then is adversely increased. So usually we have to put a little bit more elbow grease into these solutions if we're getting up and close with that equipment. And then time, if done correctly, we've seen that dry cleaning can actually uh, save you time um, from a wet cleaning process. And that translates back into, you know, improved productivity or production time um, when it comes around to it. So the steps of dry cleaning, instead of looking at, you know, pre-rinsing, washing, rinsing steps, we look at dry cleaning as a separate process. So there's a lot of concern stems from the thought that dry cleaning is very different from wet cleaning, but these steps are similar, it's just the tools that are different. So dry cleaning is really often performed because of sensitive electrical equipment. So before you start, you need to make sure that you secure and disassemble any equipment. So lock out, peg out any equipment, isolate parts or disassemble your equipment if you can do a wet clean or a soak away from that area, um, and then make sure that they're dry before putting them back. Um, but then we move into dry cleaning the rest of the equipment. So we recommend uh, dry cleaning from the top down, um, and that's because dry processing often has crumbs or larger gross soil. So if you clean from the top down, gravity makes them fall to the bottom of the equipment. So if you clean from the top down, you're not recontaminating areas that you've already cleaned. Then we do detail clean. Um, so this is really knowing the piece of equipment that you're cleaning on. You know, there's some points that could have more harbors than others or some nooks and crannies um, where soil might be hiding out more than other places. So do that detailed clean, figure out what those hard places to clean are, and really look at those before you do your post inspection, um, and then re-clean if necessary. And then after, you're going to verify whether you're swabbing or visual techniques, and then do your no-rinse sanitizing steps. That's, we still have to do our wash and our sanitize with dry cleaning. Uh, we're just going to do some different steps in between. So now I'm going to go, go over some common methods of dry cleaning. We're going to discuss the advantages and disadvantages of these methods, and then, you know, just also explain what they are. A combination of them really does usually end up in the most productive and efficient cleaning and sanitation program. But again, you need to validate that each method you choose is best for the area that you're using it in, and that cleaning can be consistent from day to day. So we're going to go over no moisture clean methods first. There's six that we're going to touch on. And then we'll move to three low moisture cleaning methods. So first, we have just good old manual action. Uh, usually this is done with color-coded brushes or mops, um, any scrubbers that you can use. We usually use that color-coded tool system. Um, these are great um, because we can dedicate them to specific lines. We have different colors um, that are standardized across the plant. You know, black for floors or drains, green if you have allergens or organics or something special. Um, we have that standard system that we can use so everybody knows what it's used for. They use a limited amount of cleaner and water. You have that, you know, elbow grease that you're putting behind the, the, this tool to do a lot of the cleaning for you. And again, they're usually low investment costs. So they're, they're pretty inexpensive solution when we're thinking in terms of, of investment. Some disadvantages, um, you do uh, tend to have a large time input if you're using scrubbing or, or manual action alone on a piece of equipment to get off soil. And then portability. You increase the risk of cross-contamination if you don't have specific areas for specific tools. So if you have, you know, say a sensitive area of the plant, say you have an allergen line, um, you need to make sure that the tools for that line stay only in that area. They can't move across barriers of the plant, otherwise that introduces the risk of cross-contamination. Vacuuming is a very common intervention in dry processing environments. Uh, it is 
uh, really easy to use. I mean, everybody grows up knowing how to vacuum. Um, so it's, it's very easy to use and very quick removal of gross soil. So if you point the vacuum at the soil, it's gone. Um, in, in dry areas, um, it's a very good to use. If you don't have introduction of moisture. Um, you shouldn't be getting moisture inside the vacuuming unit itself in dry areas. Um, but where we do see problems is in central systems and if you do get moisture in that central system. Um, so if water makes it w its way into there, it can become a growth point for microorganisms. And if that vacuum system is not on a sanitation schedule and you're not regularly cleaning that out, that can be a source of pathogen growth. So maintain, you know, a big difference between your wet and dry areas if you're using a vacuuming system. You want to reduce that crossover. And then have a strict cleaning process for those units. Build that into your SSOPs. Be doing that regularly and checking that unit regularly. Um, otherwise, we do rec recommend having portable vacuum units as well. So. Blowing air or having air guns or compressed air in a plant is very useful in tight areas. So if you can just blast it with a puff of air to get that soil out of a, a place that you can't reach it, um, you know, that's easy to do. And properly maintained units really shouldn't introduce moisture, right? It's not like a vacuum. You wouldn't be sucking up any moisture into it. You're, you're pushing out air at a surface. So they should be safe from that perspective. But when you're really thinking about it, blowing air or using compressed air doesn't really eliminate a soil. It doesn't really clean a surface. It's just making it easier to reach that soil. So you're simply moving it from one harder to reach place to an easier one. So it may be easy up front, but you end up doing twice the cleaning uh, because you still have to clean up that soil, uh, which could result in a loss of productivity. And then also consider the risk of cross-contamination. So if you hit a surface with, um, you know, high compressed air, you don't know where that soil is going to transport to. It can poof and go up on another piece of equipment that you didn't want it to go on. So make sure that you are aware of that risk and use it really only when necessary and in contained areas. Hot oil flushing is a pretty uh, specialized uh, method of cleaning. It's commonly used for manufacturing of nut butters or peanut butters, um, other types of, of waxes or oils like that. It really solubilizes those greases and fats. It uses a, a hot oil solution that is pushed through piping. Um, about 150 degrees Fahrenheit it operates around. Um, and then it uses that hot temperature and that contact time moving through those pipe systems um, to do the cleaning out and solubilizing of those soils. So this, is, again, is a very specialized piece of equipment. Say some disadvantages is the high temperature. You want to make sure that anybody who's using this piece of, of equipment is trained to use it, is wearing the proper PPE, and is not coming in contact with that hot oil. And then, again, there's limited cleaning capability. You still need to do a wash cycle or some sort of, of washing because the oil itself um, is not a cleaner, right? So you still need to uh, clean the inside of those surfaces. Piggies. Uh, pigs are sort of like a, a plastic bullet that fits inside pipes. So there's many different sizes that they come in. You push them in at the start of a piping and they either come out at the, at the end of the line or at a T in the line, they can come out. Um, but it's basically pushing through this, this rubber stopper um, to remove gross soil on the inside of pipes. So you make it so it fits in nice and snug, and then it kind of scrapes the inside of the pipes to, to mechanically pull off that soil. This is a really great intervention because it doesn't introduce moisture, right? It's a completely you know, moisture-free operation, and they're pretty inexpensive. It's a low capital investment to buy these pigs. But a disadvantage is limited cleaning capability. This is a lot like the compressed air system. We're removing soil from a hard-to-reach place inside piping or inside equipment to an easier-to-reach place. It comes out the end and 
now we can clean that up, right? So it's an easy to reach place and we can get that soil out. And then lastly, for, for a no moisture clean method, we have particle-based blasting. This is also known as dry ice blasting or CO2 blasting. Um, this is when uh, carbon dioxide, frozen carbon dioxide particles um, come out of a pressurized unit and hit a, a soiled surface at very high velocity and they sublime upon uh, hitting the air or the environment. And that causes the soil to basically break apart um, when, it, when it comes in contact with that carbon dioxide. Um, so it really disrupts that soil. It's great for really hard soils, really hard to clean, tenacious soils. Um, it's, it's a very aggressive cleaning tactic. Um, but it does increase the risk of cross-contamination. So just like blowing air to surface, if you blast the surface uh, with, with particle-based blasting, you're going to have soil transport to other surfaces. So make sure that you can contain that or that you're in a, in a contained area. Um, and then just be aware that post-blast wiping is usually required. So you need to wipe off surfaces or surrounding surfaces after you use this intervention. Moving to low moisture cleaning methods, um, steam cleaning is a very common um, method, or it's also called dry vapor cleaning. So this uses uh, steam to get into hard to reach places. Um, that's where we really recommend it for. The steam can penetrate and cling to surfaces that cloths and tools can't reach. So in, in environments where you can't, you know, use a cloth or use a tool to get to that, to that surface, this would be a good option. Um, some disadvantages, it can be high upfront equipment costs. You can rent these units if you only need to use it periodically, um, but if you buy your own units, it's a little bit more of an investment. Um, and then it does use a concentrated amount of water, uh, which does introduce residual moisture that you'll need to mop up or somehow uh, get rid of in, in the area that you're using it. Cleaning out of place, um, thinking back to that seven steps of dry cleaning, this method can be used on equipment that can be dissembled. So anything that we, you know, lock out or take out, dissemble, take away from the environment, um, this would be that cleaning out of place method. You can isolate moisture from that dry environment by distancing the COP washing area from your equipment. And this method is usually highly effective um, against microorganisms because you can use that higher temperature uh, cleaning solution, you can use that higher chemistry concentration, um, and you get a more consistent, effective cleaning. Some disadvantages, uh, disassembly of equipment can take time, um, so you don't want to be undoing your conveyor belt, you know, every time you need to clean, um, but if you need a very consistent clean and you can take those apart, um, this would be a good place to use it. Um, and then you do introduce a possibility of cross-contamination, so if you're Dissembling, uh, if you've got multiple lines in your plant and they run different flavorings or, or have an, an allergen on one line, if you put everything in the same place to clean it and then bring it back, you have no way of knowing which, uh, you know, conveyor belt went on this line and which conveyor belt went on this line, and your sour cream and onion chips might taste like cheddar next time you do it. So. Make sure that you have designated areas if you have sensitive flavors or sensitive allergens in your plant. And then the last moment moisture cleaning uh, method that we recommend in dry environments is an alcohol-based cleaning product. So these are great because alcohol makes them quick drying and we do limit the use of water that we do use with these cleaners. Alcohol is, is a neutral solution and can generally be used on pretty sensitive equipment. So if we know we have a lot of equipment with different plastics or elastomers, different metals, alcohol is uh, pretty universally compatible with a lot of things. Uh, some disadvantages, oftentimes it has to be manually applied um, because alcohol introduces a flammability risk. Uh, if you use a high concentration of it, you can't use it in, in automated units oftentimes. Um, and so that does tie into the safety factor as well if you need to specially 
store or ship alcohol products. So now I'll transition to Rick, who will discuss more in depth why these dry cleaning methods really matter, and especially in relation to allergen management. And please remember, you can submit a question for the question and answer session anytime throughout the presentation through the Q&A function or on your WebEx. Rick? Okay. Thank you, Amy. Um, yeah, I would like to talk to you guys a little bit about what we're really trying to achieve here with some of these dry cleaning methods. One measure for what we're trying to achieve is recalls or regulatory compliance. And here's an example of some, some recalls that have affected dry environments. Listeria salmonella, key microorganisms, pathogens that we're concerned about that have caused recalls for many, many years now. Um, in 2010, you can see some of the numbers here. But one of the things to note here is also in dry environments, a key concern is allergy. So in more recent data, in 2015, actually combining listeria and salmonella, it ends up to be fewer recalls than allergens. Allergens in 2015 accounted for 205 recalls versus salmonella at 99 and listeria at 79. So you can see a shift that's been occurring in the industry where allergens have been increasingly important and more important because of the regulatory compliance. A lot more recalls out there because of it. So let's talk about allergens then. Allergens, there actually are more than eight food allergens. There's actually more like a couple hundred different types of food allergens that have been identified. But typically what we're thinking of when we think of allergens, at least in the U.S., we talk about the top eight. The reason you have the top eight is because that accounts for about 90% of all the food allergies in the United States. Now, that starts to shift when you look around the world, because in the U.S., allergens affect about 15 million people, but looking around the world, different population densities, different food um, practices cause different allergens, and regulations are a little bit different. So as our companies are becoming increasingly global, you have to understand not only where am I potentially shipping products to, because you'll have some kind of label compliance concerns. If I want to ship something to Canada, i got to consider that mustard is an allergen. So even though in the U.S. mustard isn't considered an allergen, in Canada it is. But I also want to keep into account my ingredients. So if I'm getting ingredients from all around the world, which is quite typical nowadays, you might want to double check what kind of allergens may or may not be accounted for because that country or that region doesn't consider something you would consider an allergen. So looking at allergens can be a little bit complex. There are a lot of components that you have to consider. I am going to focus here on cleaning and sanitizing, but I want to take a second to let you know all of these other pieces to the allergen management puzzle are important. So you have to get these components in place, otherwise your cleaning and sanitizing might not do you any good. So some of the components are like raw materials. Do you understand the risks that are coming in from your raw materials? Are they appropriately labeled? Speaking of labels, are your labels reviewed for allergens? There's certain rules on how you manage allergens with your labeling. Another one that I know is fairly common um, thing to potentially consider here is production and rework. How does rework go back in my process? So as I've done allergen management plan reviews, I've identified numerous times where rework is kind of just introduced into a number of different formulas and could be spread across lines and wasn't really counting for an allergen potential here. So you can identify that. Training is an important thing because training especially as the sensitivity of allergen, is, it's very sensitive, so only a very small amount of an allergen can cause a reaction. So making sure everyone in the facility is aware of what allergens you're trying to control, which ones we accept in the plant and which ones we don't want in the plant at all, it can go so far as even in cafeterias or break room areas. 
There are restrictions I've seen in plants where you cannot have a peanut or something like that. So no peanut butter and jelly sandwiches in the break room because the break rooms happen to be in certain areas that it's very difficult to control. But those are all considerations that you should have. Let's talk about cleaning and sanitation. Developing procedures for dry cleaning procedures, especially for allergens, we got to do a little bit of housekeeping first. You got to make sure you have an allergen policy. The allergen policy really will establish the ground rule. You want to develop some kind of hierarchy on how allergens could potentially be introduced. The hierarchy is important because you want to start at what is the lowest risk possibility for an allergen. So by not introducing it into my facility at all, I significantly lower my risk. So can I prevent this from being in my facility at all? There's a number of allergens that you'll be controlling that should not be in your facility at all. Fish. There are a lot of people that don't are making dairy or something like that don't really add fish. So that should be on your allergen policy. You can't introduce something like that and work that into your other uh, groups and other policies like when you your R&D group gets really creative. Make sure they understand what kind of limitations you might have on allergens so they don't get too carried away there. Another risk that's a little bit more risk but still controllable, and a lot of people do this, is you segregate lines or equipment. You start to separate your factory. This side of the factory is an allergen side, this side is not, or there's specific allergens. Uh, a lot of people that make Peanut butter, along with a lot of other condiments, would have the peanut butter processing completely separate because such a sensitivity there. Uh, moving down the list, you're going to see cleaning and sanitation. This is where, once you get to that point, separation, you got to make sure if I'm going to run different allergens on the same line, I might be able to clean it, clean it well enough that I can ensure that allergens are not present after I'm done cleaning. So, but again, that's increased risk because now you're relying on that exact cleaning procedure with no changes to occur to prevent allergen cross contact. And the last one is the precautionary labeling. Why is that a risk? If I just put may contain on everything I make, why is that a risk? That risk is really towards the consumer side because what's been shown in a number of studies is that consumers who eat an object or an item and they don't have a reaction. So a lot of times they don't know they're allergic or they think they're allergic but aren't sure. They'll see that label and ignore it. They start to just become complacent. Now what actually could be happening if you're doing a may contain is you don't have it in that product and then one day you actually do have it in that sample that they are eating and they have a severe reaction. And so who's responsible for that, the may contain label, it's, it's a really important issue. I'm focusing on I don't want to injure anybody for any reason, not just the responsibility. So that's why the may contain is where I put it at the highest risk of how to control allergens. So next step, assessment checklist. Why do we develop a checklist? It's because I want to be consistent. What am I looking at? I told you there were a lot of components to an allergen management plan, if I don't develop a checklist, then I won't necessarily be consistent when I evaluate one new product to another or a line to another. So you want to start to write down all those things that could affect allergen cleaning. So do I have a set separation within the facility? Put it on the checklist so I can review it. What about my incoming ingredients? Put those on the checklist. Make sure all of these different components are reviewed because there's going to be a lot to it. That's why the checklists are developed. Now we're ready to develop the cleaning process. So some development of a cleaning process is very similar to regular cleaning process. Um, but when you start to think of allergens, there's a couple key concerns here. Normal cleaning processes, whatever soils are present, those are good enough to try your cleaning solution on there. Here, you want to consider what allergens are the hardest to clean, because not all allergens are equally easy to clean. In my experience, I, I've identified that a number of times discrete allergens 
can get caught up in catch point and the chemicals or whatever we're using to clean the process is not able to break down that allergen particle enough so that it is easily removed. So it kind of hangs around for a while sometimes after multiple attempts. Homogeneous allergens are in general easier, but the difference with homogeneous allergens, what I mean by a homogeneous allergen is something that is continuous, continuously distributed throughout the product, like a milk. If you blend in milk, it kind of disappears, it's all around, but homogeneous allergens could be difficult if the homogeneous allergen is at a very high concentration. Okay. So after you figure that out, uh, production procedures are also important. You want to make sure you run the line long enough. If you only ran for five minutes or 5,000 gallons or whatever it is, maybe that's not representative, so your cleaning process could clean that run but not a normal run for you. And document, document everything so that you know what's working, what's not working. That will move you into validation. I'll talk a little bit about validation on the next slide, but here I just want to mention new validations. They're very similar to when you would repeat a half of validation, for example. A change in a formula, change in a new product being added to a line, or your equipment. You're changing out your equipment. Or lastly, people sometimes forget about doing this just on a predetermined schedule, every year, every couple years, because lines age. Things change that aren't necessarily documented very well, so you want to catch those periodically with that periodic review. Allergen validation piece. Here, allergen validation really will typically consist of two components. You'll have a physical validation, which is that visual inspection. You're actually looking for the allergen. You use flashlights, you identify the catch points, go in there, tear things apart, apart looking for allergen pieces. What you want to do is make sure that cleaning process can consistently remove all the allergens from all the known catch points in the line. You want that consistency to have some assurance that, yes, this is valid. Analytical validation is a test method. Now, there's a lot of different test methods out there, but some of the more common ones are swabbing for allergens because the allergen presence can be parts per billion, very, very small levels that you might not be able to detect visually but are still there and can still do harm. So one thing to make sure you're doing is testing your positive control because, as you'll find out with allergen tests, not all of them are created equal, and they don't all work equally well in different products. So you've got to test your positive to make sure you can find it when you know it's there. So grab some of the allergen-containing product, test it. You're also looking for hardest to clean. This is not a time where you're just swabbing the center of a conveyor belt that's easy to clean. You want to test the hard to clean area. But overall, kit choice, it's, you're going to have a lot of choices out there. Just make sure you're paying attention to sensitivity, how quick you need an answer on the validation, some of those considerations. Now I'd like to turn it back over to Amy. So we've already talked about cleaning in a dry environment, but what about sanitizing? So even in a dry uh, area, pathogens exist in your facility, and they can enter the plant through raw materials, through the environment, which includes your equipment, pests, dust, air, um, or they can come in on your personnel. So even if water is not present, many microorganisms are really able to survive uh, dry environments and dry processes. So as you can see on the right-hand chart, microbial growth persists when all four of those factors are present. You have to have an optimum temperature, optimum water activity, oxygen level, and pH. So decreased water activity definitely discourages microbial growth but the other factors still influence the pathogen's behavior. So once in a dry state, bacteria's metabolism is greatly reduced, meaning there isn't growth, but vegetative cells and spores can still remain viable for several months or even years. And the, the present survival and heat resistance of pathogens in low water activity foods provide a, a continuing challenge in our industry. Salmonella is highly prevalent in dry food facilities because of its ability to survive for long periods without growth. And this shows up in statistics, right? Salmonella is responsible for 94% of 
of U.S. flow water activity food recall. So some common sanitizers for dry environments. We already mentioned we've got alcohol sanitizers. This includes dry sand duo, which we're going to go over in a bit, RTU surface sanitizer, which is a high alcohol product, and then alcohol wipes, eco wipes. Quat or quaternary ammonium compound solutions are also very common. These are great to have some residual sanitizing activities, such as Corm Clear 5 and Fanny Step, which is a floor sanitizer. Then we also have that quat compound with peracetic acid. So this includes our biofilm disinfectant Boost 3200 and 3201 solutions, or Boost FT, which is our floor care solution. So thinking back to that comprehensive uh, dry processing component, that, that circled chart that we saw at the beginning, hygiene and housekeeping is, is another part of that puzzle. Incremental tactics are really key to maintaining a dry and a clean environment. So make sure that we have these personnel interventions to reduce pathogen load. We have hand washing stations, hopefully at every entrance to our plant, make sure that people are using those. Um, hair and beard nets are great. Maybe have, consider some lint or hair removal. So having those by your hand wash stations, if you know somebody on the team has a lot of cats at home or something like mm -hmm. that. Um, and then consider a hygienic footwear program. We've seen a lot of success um, having footwear cleaning or sanitizing units um, outside of coming into a facility. And then also looking at pets. Um, we can move to the next slide here. Pest management is, is another uh, area that we need to consider. A lot of the soils that are in these facilities are attractive to pests. So to minimize the need for a pest program, we want to have ongoing dry removal. And we want to really identify which ones are going to be the most problematic for us. So those are Indian meal moths, flower beetles are going to be big ones, and then grain and carpet beetles are another common one. And they're really a source of, of contamination, right? If they touch one surface that has um, pathogens or allergens on them, they're going to be a source of cross-contamination. So prevention and early identification is key. We want to prevent these guys from coming in before we have to react to them. That can be costly and just not something we want to deal with. Plant traffic and zoning, you know, floors are one of the largest cross-contamination substrates in our plants, routine cleaning of those, um, you know, improves our plant appearance and then reduces opportunities for cross-contamination. So really focus on the passageway. Um, look for those sensitive areas that you have um, and then implement uh, sanitizing masks, doorway foaming units, boot scrubbers and sanitation units. Um, those boot scrubbers are really ideal for dry processing environment. It keeps the uh, any washing chemistry contained um, and is really uh, great for before entering or leaving a facility. And then look at personal protective equipment or equipment and tools as ways that you can uh, manage your zoning. So make sure that we're looking at things that people wear every day, safety glasses, boots, smocks. If those need to go on an SSOP, make sure that we're putting those in there. And then lastly, training. Build any dry processes into your SSOP and have a timeline, uh, whether it's just constant removal or having deep cleans, make sure you have those on your timeline. And then again, make sure personnel know why they're doing what they're doing and not just how to do it. So this means if they, if they know that water in an area is going to be detrimental, they're going to clean it up. They're just not going to pass it by. Um, so they know why it, it causes problems. And then understand the reality of long-term compliance. So know the culture of the plants. Are these um, new processes or procedures really going to make an impact? Are people really going to use these? Um, and then just think about you know, time, money. Those are always constant restraints in anything that we do. Um, but really look at the ones that fit for you. So we're just going to touch um, briefly on some revolutionary in-market solutions that we have now, um, which is dry sand duo. So traditional processes, right, we had a lot of different cleaning methods we could do. We had different sanitizing solutions. What if we could just make those into one step, uh, one cleaner, rather, and, and one sanitizer all together? So that comes into dry sand duo. 
And Thrive Duo was developed uh, really to demonstrate Ecolab's ongoing commitment to promote and advance food safety. So Drysan Duo is an EPA-registered, ready-to-use two-step cleaner and sanitizer. And what I mean by two-step cleaner and sanitizer is you can use it once as a cleaner, and then you simply have to wipe it off the surface. So it completely eliminates water, which is a, a giant food safety risk in dry facilities, um, and then you spray it on again as a no-rinse sanitizer. So it can be used on food contact, non-food contact surfaces, it's great against a variety of microorganisms, Listeria, Salmonella, Chronobacter, um, and then this is a low alcohol formula. So I mentioned before alcohol sanitizers can uh, bring up some flammability risk. This is low alcohol, so it's, uh, it's non-flammable, um, so it doesn't have the same storage uh, requirements or safety considerations as some other products do. So like I mentioned, uh, it's a two-in-one product, so you can use it as a cleaner first. You spray it on the surface and you wipe it clean. You use a disposable cloth or a laundered cloth and you wipe that soil from the surface. You do not need to rinse it as is every other traditional cleaner out on the market. And then you uh, apply it again as a no-rinse sanitizer and let it dry before starting back up in production. So dry sand duo, uh, when compared to a water control under identical laboratory conditions, helps remove, remove food soil that contains a food allergen. So stainless steel coupons were mechanically soiled with a mixture of allergen-containing food ingredients, including peanut butter, which we are highlighting here, and water and isopropyl alcohol-based sanitizer, which was used as a comparative test product, or dry sand duo were sprayed under that coupon and allowed to sit, and then the coupons were dry with a dry disposable towel and swabbed with an enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, or ELISA, test kit for the peanut allergen. So as you can see, Dry Sand Duo, when used in accordance with Equalab's product label instructions, can be used as a part of an allergen management program to help remove soil containing food allergen proteins from food processing surfaces. So, however, a customer is still responsible for any required validation or verification of their own food safety plan or allergen management program. It can still uh, be shown in this way to be comparative to water. Just a couple case studies here. Um, we've shown that dry skin dual really helps save time. So, I mentioned before dry processes can save time as compared to wet processes. At this facility, we completely eliminated 100% of their water, and we gave them back about 1,800 production hours um, on all of the lines that we were using it on. And just also highlighting here, we did test they had, were running a dairy allergen, and they were packing with their wet cleaning processes, but then when we transferred them to a completely dry cleaning program, they also passed. And here's another one. Um, this was at a snack food, um, especially in their packaging equipment area. Um, but we used it on their packages and then on their conveyor belts. And we saw, again, passing on their allergens, so their wet cleaning procedures were doing great. But we transferred them to eliminating 100% of water, and we were still passing both dairy and gluten allergen tests um, for their surfaces. And lastly, I just want to highlight some uh, equipment that can be used with Dry Sand Duo. We have large spray units that can be used on large area applications, 5 and 20 gallon capacity units. And then Dry Sand Duo, because of its low flammability requirements, can also be used in footwear sanitation units. Um, so those are also an option with Dry Sand Duo. So in conclusion, uh, dry cleaning just relies on that specialized level of clean. Really know your needs um, and when a combination of no moisture and limited moisture methods are needed. Um, any uh, place that you put in a dry measure uh, needs to be integrated into your comprehensive food safety program. And make sure that you collaborate with everybody on your team. That includes quality teams, sanitation teams, production, maintenance teams. Everyone needs to be involved and aware of the changes. And so we've just really challenged your teams to come up with an action plan. Identify your existing dry cleaning challenges, 
recognize and approve around those dry operations that you already have in place, and then survey which areas could really benefit from additional dry cleaning. So thank you. I will pass it on to Megan. I think we have a few short minutes um, for the Q&A session. Thank you, Amy and Rick, for a great um, webinar presentation. We do have a couple of um, questions here that have come in that um, we will attempt to get to as many as possible. Any that we do not get to will be answered by your local um, Ecolab representative. So one question is, what is an example of um, a situation where dry cleaning improves worker safety? So I guess I would just highlight dry sand duo. Um, at one facility we were doing a field test um, and they were using wet cleaning procedures. They were using a hot caustic wash inside of a dough hopper. Um, and they actually had someone going in with this hot caustic inside of the dough hopper and cleaning it from the inside. Um, and so we introduced dry sand duo, which is a neutral cleaner, which doesn't require PPE in the US. And we introduced that into their plant replace that hot caustic in an enclosed environment, and the worker was just eternally grateful not to have to wear, you know, all of that PPE inside of that closed environment. Um, and so that was a, a really big um, improvement on safety just by switching to a dry solution. And then how about a couple quick more? Do any of these dry cleaning methods work against chronobacter? Yes. So dry cleaning too, obviously, up front. Um, but then we also do have um, products that have Chronobacter listed on the label. Um, I would get in contact with your local account manager. Um, they'll have all of the label details, and it's listed right out on that product itself, what organisms it's effective against and on in which applications. Okay. And how about um, what is the maximum air pressure that should be used in these dry applications? So if you are using compressed air, we do recommend that you only go up to 30 PSI. That's the maximum you can, can use. Um, you're still going to get some um, air transfer with that, um, but we only recommend 30 PSI. And then using sterile air. So the industry accepted standard is a 7 log reduction using sterile air. Okay. And then finally, with vacuuming, do we recommend HEPA filter and inclusion of the vacuum on a routine sanitation? Definitely. So we do recommend help HEPA filters um, to avoid cross-contamination, and that means that we're, we're getting rid of about 99.97% of particles that have a size of above 0.3 micrometers. Um, so the HEPA filters really reduce um, the risk of getting pathogens into our plant with a, a, a compressed air system. And then we do recommend putting those, especially if you have a central system, on your, on your SSOPs and cleaning those out regularly. Excellent. Thank you, Amy, for those responses. Um, I'm showing the resources and tools that we do have available to you, uh, those of you on the call. Um, we have many resources and tools that we will share with you. Um, we'll follow up with an email in about a week. Um, so for your reference, everyone who's registered for today's webinar will receive an email with a link to the WebEx recording and access to the resources listed here. We have some case studies, uh, technical videos, and um, allergen guidelines, et cetera. We thank you for your continued partnership in business. Please reach out to your Ecolab representative if you have any questions and need any help to develop a cleaning and sanitizing plan that would be customized for your production facility. Thank you.